So John, underpinning your 2017 recommendation seems to be the need to embed a cultural change to support dysfunctional separated parental relationships, providing outcome-based programmes with a one-stop shop approach. Given that cultural change is challenging, what steps do you see need to happen to begin this process and who needs to lead on this? Yeah, cultural changes are always difficult. Um, they're the most difficult um, changes to bring about. Uh, and the truth of the matter is that you have to recognise that family relationships involve the most intimate of relations that one can conceive of. Uh, they're private and they're difficult to police. And therefore, trying to, to resolve those problems uh, is, uh, is a major difficulty. And I think that the key to it is to bring about changes in the law, because I believe that law can influence culture. We've changed the culture in a number of different areas in the law, and this is a classic example of it. And therefore, in, for example, if you look in England, they have the Section 10 of the Children and Families Act 2014, which ensures that all litigants who intend to bring uh, proceedings involving uh, children have to attend uh, mediation, or have to consider rather mediation, before issuing uh, any private law proceedings. Uh, in New Zealand, they have a parenting through separation uh, scheme, which means that parents are obliged to attend, uh, along with each other, uh, free sessions, in which there's a counsellor and a psychologist there, who will give them real information about the full consequences of what they are doing. Uh, in terms of their children. Now, the, the, one has to look at the question of mandatory attendances. Will people do that? Well, if the position is that proceedings are not going to be issued unless these steps are taken, then I think you will find a change because in essence, the, the, uh, the, the thing that always gripped me when I was a family judge for a number of years was that Essentially, these are really decent people who happen to be separating. Life has, has just taken a bad turn for them. And they don't realise the dangers that lie in the wake of that for their children. We've got to help them change. Following on from that, um, you refer in your 2017 report to the need for accessible family mediation. How do you see a professional model with high quality standardised practice, monitoring and accountability being integrated across all providers? Well, I think there has to be some kind of control, supervision and guidance. This area of mediation, I think, is a specialist field. It is not open to well-meaning amateurs. I think that mediators need to be really professional, really well informed and be monitored. And therefore, I think that there should be some form of licensing uh, of mediation groups if they're to obtain government funding and government money. Government money is precious. It is difficult to obtain and it must be well spent. It should not be granted unless those who are carrying out those mediations are well informed and are professional. So therefore, I think there should be standards set, probably by the Department of Justice, probably by the Department of Health, before government funding is given to, to mediation groups. Thank you. So John, you've made reference there to your lifetime of experience in the law, and particularly more recently in family law. Can you provide our audience with some insight into private family law cases or scenarios that support the argument for clear benefits of family mediation and the inappropriateness of adversarial litigation on the mental health of children and parents? I think during my time, I was six years as a senior family judge in, in Northern Ireland. I think during that time, the greatest difficulty that I encountered was the intractable contact problems, where mum and dad had sadly split up. And the, the rupture that was caused, unfortunately, spilled over into the way that the, treat, the children were treated. And so there was one parent or another parent that went to war with the other one. And the difficulty was that children were right in the middle. 
and the parties who were suffering more than, than any other were the children. And again, I firmly believe that that was because the warring parties had lost sight of what they were doing to their children. They were so keen to score points over one another. One had behaved maybe very badly and merited uh, all kinds of, of uh, acrimony that was arising. Um, but sadly, in, 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 in visiting that retribution upon party A, um, party B was damaging profoundly the children. And, and I think that something like mediation, where people are obliged before they bring proceedings to speak to a mediator, whether it be a psychologist or a counsellor or a trained mediator, and to explain to them just what the consequences are of this intractable behaviour. Um, I think decent people will find that the penny drops and that in most cases uh, I think you'll find that mediation um, before the court process, before the court process has started, um, will I think solve a great number of problems. It won't solve everything. You'll always get aberrant people who cannot be controlled. But I think in most cases, there is a classic example of where mediation would benefit not only them for their lives, but also, more importantly, their children. Um, your review of civil and family law in 2017 was groundbreaking, innovative and forward-facing, with hundreds of recommendations across family law. What are your thoughts some four years later with the lack of action regarding diversion reactions, plans to provide information support that encourage separated parents to manage their separation by engaging with mediation. It saddens me greatly that uh, greater activity has not been engendered uh, in the wake of, of the, the reforms that I suggested. There is no doubt that there has been great delay in implementing these necessary uh, changes. And until this is done, until these changes are made, we're going to keep on meeting the same problems that are endemic in the family justice system and have been endemic for decades. And what one has to realise, what the government and what the Department of Justice and the Department of Health and so on has to appreciate, is that you need to invest to save. The amount of public money that is wasted in the family justice system with huge delays in cases being resolved, warning parties with solicitors and barristers on either side fighting the bid out, is, is, it's incomprehensible that we allow that to go on. And whereas if we invested in the kind of mediation that we're all, I think, present here today are in favour of, that is investing to save. You will bring about uh, uh, resolutions that are more lasting and durable. You will bring about swifter justice. You will reduce the number of cases. You will reduce the amount of legal aid invested in lawyers in fighting these cases out. And until the departments grasp that issue, until the government and responsible grasps that issue, I'm afraid that change is not going to happen. Uh, so therefore, and dare I say it, I think the real problem lies with the failure of government to grasp the nettle. It needs to be given greater attention and greater funding, greater resources. And the way to deal with that, I think, is to find champions. Champions for the cause of family justice in particular, and champions for the cause of what we're talking about largely now, mediation in child care and in the separation of parents. And so I think that, that the way to change this is for the uh, uh, groups like yours, uh, societies like yours, to find champions who will stand up and speak about this, who will speak about it in the assembly, who will, uh, people will contact uh, their uh, assembly members uh, so that there will be a voice now that for too long has been either silenced or muffled. Uh, we're on the cusp of change in society about the way we deal with um, uh, childcare, with family justice. 
And just one more question in relation to um, the UNCRC and the child's rights in relation to family breakdown. Who do you see would be best placed to champion the rights of the child to a healthy and safe relationship with both parents post-separation? That's a broad question and it requires a broad approach. I'm a firm believer in training. The judiciary needs more training in this area. The barristers and solicitors who act in these cases need more training in this area. These issues and the rights of the child have to become an absolute priority throughout this. Um, and, and I believe that the, the days of, of um, uh, the Bar Council and the Law Society doing their own training has to change. Good people like yourselves have to be brought in. We have to have professionals brought in to uh, uh, deal with these matters, to highlight the rights of children, so that through the family justice system, the priority of children comes not only from other cases and from people reading the UN Convention, the rights of the child, but it comes from the pores of those who are conducting these cases, judges who are hearing them, barristers and solicitors who are acting in them. And that involves very much, again, the input from groups such as uh, yours, uh, professional mediators, professional people who are bent on ensuring that problems of family justice, that the rights of children are not confined to court problems but bring in problem-solving courts who look outside the court arena and who look to other avenues for uh, uh, processing these cases.